Our speaker for today is Yalda Ulis. I'm not even sure how you pronounce your last name. So maybe Ulis. 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 Wonderful. Um, so uh, she's uh, a former senior executive from MGM and Sony, and she left the movie world to study child development and earned a PhD in psychology at UCLA. And she became, now she's uh, working as a research scientist and the founder of the uh, nonprofit Center for Scholars and Storytellers at UCLA. And um, she, she left the movie world to study child development. Oh, I told you that. She uh, recently founded the, the, the center and it's dedicated to bringing, bridging the work of child development researchers and youth content creators. And so that's where much of the research, which I'm hoping we're gonna learn a little more about today, um, is uh, uh, on how media uh, affects the social behavior of children and at different developmental stages. So um, uh, including, I, I think up to college is <laughs> from what I understand from your, your work. Okay, so um, I'm gonna let her go ahead. And uh, as I said, we're, we are recording this. So those of you that are interested should make maybe either let me know or let Justin know that you wanna get a recording of it. And um, he can probably take care of that, right? Okay, I'm gonna turn Great. it over to Yalda now. Thank you, thank you. First of all, I have to say, I love, I'm assuming all of you are UCLA enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Part of my my uh, reason for starting the center um, is also because you know traditionally work with the entertainment industry is um, highlighted at USC, and yet UCLA is an amazing school. I have two degrees from UCLA: an MBA, which I got when I was 24, and then a PhD when I got in my 40s. And um, so anyway, I just I just you know. I love having a group of UCLA enthusiasts because anyone who is a Bruin who interacts with our center, we're like, yes, we're gonna get UCLA. That's when you think entertainment media, you think UCLA, not USC. So I'm sorry if some of you also support USC, but um, so let me, I'm gonna share my screen and take you through a deck. I'm gonna interrupt you just for a second because I would ask people to mute themselves while y'all just talking. So you Good idea. So um, this this talk is really, I, it, you know, I do a lot of talks for parents and then I do do Center for Scholars and Storytellers talks. This is kind of a mixture. Um, and then I hope it'll, it can be conversational. Um, I do have to leave at one, so hopefully that's okay. Um, so I got my MBA and PhD from uh, UCLA and I founded the center. We're in the psychology department where I got my PhD. And I've also written a parenting book um, called Media Moms and Digital Dads. Um, so what I'll take you through today is a little bit of my background because it definitely informs um, the center. Um, we'll talk about uh, why storytelling. Um, then I'll tell you about the work we do at the center. I'm gonna really shorten the parenting in the digital age piece because most of you, I believe, you know, successfully um, launch children and, and you know, you, you probably have questions about grandchildren and there's actually a lot of um, interesting research around video chat and stuff like that. So um, as a way to interact um, with grandchildren. Um, and then I have this piece of, that uh, talks about maximum, I think it's really interesting. It's about research, uh, the positive impact of storytelling. And if you guys are interested in that, I can do that. Um, so, as you heard, my background is um, I used to be in the film business. Um, this movie on the right, Mi Familia, uh, my family was the very first movie that I made. Um, it's still taught um, in school sometimes. It's a story, a, a multi-generational story about immigration. Um, it's a Mexican family. And my parents are Persian immigrants. And um, side note, my mom who, um, is a breast cancer scientist. Um, she, uh, I took ballet when I was six and Kamala Harris was in my ballet class and my mom and uh, Kamala Harris's mom, Shamala, were both breast cancer scientists, both immigrants. Um, 
got to know each other. And, and so I knew Kamala when I was six and seven, but no longer, but it's a, it's a fun story. Um, anyway, so as an immigrant and the producer of that, um, or a child of immigrants, um, of that movie was Francis Ford Coppola, who's also a child of immigrants. Um, it was just this great movie that really, you know, it's, it's about the immigrant experience. And there's a lot of research that says it's, there are similarities um, as, as the next generation acculturates. Um, so it was something I'm very proud of. Um, on the left are some of the other movies that I did. Um, my maiden name is Tehranian. And then when I got to UCLA, when, after I had kids, I stepped off, um, took a few years off and then decided to go back to school to get a PhD, um, sort of embracing my background, my genetic background, since I come from all this family of a lot of academics. Um, and one of the things I was always drawn to is sharing the research with the public. And at that point, I was very interested in sharing it with parents. Um, since I am a parent, my kids were young as I was going through school. Um, so I, I was, um, there's a great organization in the psychology department that's run by graduate students called Psychology in Action that myself and another student revitalized. And this is the book, which really takes psychological research that I studied through my PhD and um, makes them into very small, easy, understandable pieces that hopefully apply to parenting. Um, so it's always been something I care about and it's, you know, I'm doing it now for the entertainment industry as part of what we do at the center. So why am I focused at the center on storytelling? Because, you know, it's more important than ever because our world is overly saturated with media and you know, I, I created this deck pre-COVID, but, you know, it's clearly, um, COVID really changed everything. Um, and, and, you know, in many ways, thank goodness, we are this technologically advanced, um, but it also means we really need to pay attention. So, um, you know, media messages can be positive or negative, right? They can impact people positively or negatively. There's much more research on the negative effects, but there is research on positive effects. And this is just one piece of research. Um, when children, when they test gender beliefs of children um, around careers, they ask them to draw a picture of a person who has this career. So a few decades ago, uh, only 1% when, of children, when they were asked to draw scientists, drew a female. And two or three years ago, 28% drew a female. And a huge part of that is because of the media world. Um, you know, it's, it's the fact that you would expect it to get to 50 because eventually if we had no gender stereotypes, because boys will draw boys and girls will draw girls, especially at these young ages when they really have these strong gender beliefs. Um, but a lot of these kids don't have, you know, role models around them that are scientists. So they're learning it from the media. And this is a positive impact. And it's partially because um, people have been advocating for the media to, um, to portray, change what they do, and, and it's having an impact. But it also can promote harmful messages. Um, you know, this is a old quote from a FTC chairman in the 60s. Um, all television is educational television. The question is, what is it teaching? Um, you know, back then TV was considered the vast wasteland. People would talk about that. That was the quote. TV is the vast wasteland. Um, and it's around when Sesame Street started and all these um, great shows and Mr. Rogers that actually have incredibly positive impacts on kids <clears throat> is one woman I was speaking to the other day said um, she learned English from watching Sesame Street. You know, we know that from research. We know that Sesame Street has, there's posit incredibly positive impacts, but to hear that anecdotal evidence from a woman I was talking to was amazing. So that's sort of in our DNA. We, we wanna maximize the positive and minimize the harm. Um, so media has, and especially targeted to children, like we all know media, has grown. It's, you know, it used to be a television. When I grew up, it was a television with just, you know, in the living room, never moved, three to four channels, no channels for kids. But starting 1979 was the first channel launch for kids, Nick, by 2017. And, and this is not including YouTube and things like that. Um, you know, it's grown exponentially. 
Um, so now there's so much content targeted just to kids and, you know, and, and adults don't necessarily watch that stuff. You know, sometimes they do, but it's really impossible to watch it all. And, um, you know, so kids are getting these messages without adults really being involved. And, in, you know, all of us are siloed on some level with our media, but, you know, it's really important to make sure that what the kid is watching, because they don't have the learning that we have um, to, to be uh, as good as possible, as strong as possible. Um, and they're also spending, everybody's spending more time on screens. This was pre-COVID, seven plus hours a day outside of school. Now it's basically 24 seven, sadly. Um, and because um, there are so many channels and so many kids, you know, the streamers really care a lot about um, kids' content. So now you've got Netflix creating kids' content, Amazon, Apple, um, you know, Hulu. They're, they really, you know, kids like to watch things over and over again. Parents like to know that, oh, I can put my kid in front of a TV and, and there's kids' content they can watch. Um, so there's a lot of people rushing and commercial businesses whose first priority may not be um, well-being of kids are in this space. So not to mention mobile, like this picture says it all, you know, the mobile world, this was obviously pre-COVID um, in terms of closeness, no social distancing there, but uh, certainly people are using their phones for everything. Um, and um, this is for children. They have uh, the, the ownership of smartphones has grown exponentially as well. So, you know, in, um, in 2015, very few kids would get their phones 32% before the age of 11. Now 53% get their phones at the age of 11. So more than half. So it's aging down. And there's 91% versus 77% um, of kids um, that own their own homes, uh, own their own phones. So it's mobiles everywhere. Um, and I just think this stat's crazy. Um, and it's from 2014 that uh, the number of mobile devices is more than the number of people. It's definitely more than the number of toilets. <laughs> so mobile technology is a huge, you know, it's, it's a game changer and it really changed everything. When my kids were growing up, I would start giving these talks and I'd say, keep the screens out of the bedroom. And then I realized I'd given my daughter an iPod, back then an iPod, not thinking it was really a screen, but then she was able to later on, you know, access content with it. Um, you know, so these devices really have changed childhood. So this is why we exist. Um, we bring together, and it's really based on my background, researchers and st storytellers. Um, I was a storyteller. You saw Me Familia was my very first movie. I, I really cared passionately. I went into storytelling because I wanted to change the world. I felt like medias and stories impact people and they can impact them in very positive ways. Um, so I um, know there are a lot of people in the entertainment industry and some of you may have connections to it or you know may have been in it or may have no people there are a lot of people that really care about the content they make so we uh collaborate with the entertainment industry and we bring together researchers and we try to say how can we work together to make um the content that impacts children have the most positive impact um, this is another uh, interesting, it's, it's a correlational study, which is the same thing as Atlanta, it, um, the one I showed you about the, uh, the draw the scientist. Um, we can't say for sure that media did this, but um, we can speculate and there, it feels like fairly strong and positive speculation. So when Obama was president, have, have you guys heard of the unconscious bias test or the implicit association test? You know, you've, I'm sure you've heard of unconscious bias. It's out there in the world. You know, it's, you know, we all have these biases. I have biases. We all do. Um, and so there was a way to test it. It's on, you can test your own biases. It's on the Harvard website. Um, if you put in IAT and they, they have collected data for years and they were able to, in 2016, um, this was pre-Trump, that and they they thought okay race bias must have gone down because Obama was president we had a black president um, and they found that in fact the race bias hadn't changed at all and yet 
during that same period, they were able to crunch the numbers. They found that um, there was an unconscious, um, there was a reduction in unconscious LGBTQ bias. And unconscious bias is really hard to change because it's so part of us. We aren't even aware of it. So you really have to, and images and storytelling are some of the most powerful ways to change unconscious bias because uh, you're not being preached to, you're sort of, you're, you're able to absorb it because there's emotion around it. Um, so they found this re uh, reduction and they credit um, these positive representations and glee, in my opinion, was incredibly strong because it appealed to adolescents and adolescents who are at a stage, a developmental stage where, and the brain science is now telling us that that age is um, particularly important, just as important as early childhood. Um, so many things are going on at that age that so the, um, that age is a time when they're developing their identity and so media and media is really important to them and their peers. So it's, it's a critical time for, um, for attitude and behavior change and for media to have that. Oops, sorry, skip the slide. So that's what we do at the center. We, we're sort of at this, um, we focus on adolescents. Um, we're at this cross section of storytellers, scholars and youth. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons, so adolescence is now defined, and you mentioned college, um, the American Academy, I mean, the National Academy of Science now defines the um, adolescence phase from age 10 to 25. And that's based on the brain science. So it's an incredibly important time to, uh, it's an important, important developmental phase. They're making so many decisions and they're very open and flexible. And this generation is a really interesting generation. Um, so it's a time we feel that media can have the most impact. Um, so some of the things we do, we, we've been featured in a lot of the press. In fact, today we're in a lot of, uh, we're in a lot of the trade press for an article, uh, some research we did for STARS. Um, we've done an event with the TV Academy. We bring together scholars and storytellers for conversations. If you're interested in seeing any of our programming, um, I would urge you to sign up for our newsletter. And um, we just did an event last Friday that was really interesting about civic engagement. It was targeted to teens and we had the writer of Parks and Rec and Good Place and a whole bunch of other things. And a phil philosophy professor who informed his work on the good place. Um, and it was, it was a great conversation and we had a team. Uh, we have a group of about 40 uh, collab, well, fell, we have about 40 um, people who work with us who are interns, um, fellows, and then we have about 50 collaborators, people from all over, um, all, all of these um, organized uh, colleges and more who want to share their research with um, the media. They, they want to have impact with their research. And um, these are some of our fellows at the bottom. The most, many of them are grad students. They're amazing. Um, and we also collaborate with the entertainment industry. This is the producer of 13 Reasons Why. Um, these are some of the organizations we've collaborated with. And here's one of our first, uh, we got funded, we had a small grant from the Pritzker um, Center for Strengthening Families, and we, to bring together scholars and storytellers, and we were talking about foster care, which they care um, a lot about, and um, the YouTube Kids was there, and they offered us um, uh, one of their channels in their app in May of 2020, and we created these little selfies um, right here that are on the right here, and we, um, what they, what our goal was to, is to share um, that foster care, people in the foster care system are often, that's their sole identity. That's what leads their, you know, hey, I'm in, you know, people look at them like, oh, poor you, you're in the foster care system, but they, they're incredible kids and they have so much more to them. And so these kids were, I call them kids, but they're on college or after college, but they were all able to, they, they would say, hey, I'm a skateboarder, I'm a dancer, I do this, I do that, and I'm a foster kid. And these were featured in the YouTube channel. And this woman on the right, Brisa, she has a million and a half views <laughs> on her little selfie. We couldn't believe it. Somehow it went viral. And Jennifer um, Siebel Newsom tweeted about it. And they loved what we did at the center. Um, 
at the Pritzker Center. So, and it's still on there and living on. I mean, that's the thing is when you partner with a media partner, like we did with YouTube Kids, you can reach scale in the way that most research doesn't. You know, it's five people know this, 10 people know this. Um, but if you have a distribution channel like we did here and we relied on, you know, our community partners, Allies, Allies for Every Child and the Pritzker Center, and um, it, it ended up, you know, really being a wonderful uh, collaboration. Um, we also created a um, tip sheet. So we create tip sheets for the entertainment industry, but both the entertainment industry and parents and teachers have um, downloaded this, um, you know, and it's free on our site. We have um, a COVID tip sheet as well. And we have a one on race. Um, and they're basically trying to, based on research, um, we try to tell people, you know, to sort of think differently. So this is about evolving male representation. We felt that there's been so much focus on female representation, but not any on males. And if you are only changing how women come across, but you aren't changing how men are coming across, you're not gonna, it's not the whole picture. You need to think more deeply about both of them, both of the representations and how they can evolve to be more nuanced. We also, a big focus for us is diversity and inclusion and another focus is mental health. We released this report um, that got featured everywhere and it's still, people have been coming to us and asking us to do work with them because of it. Um, and it's all around the cost um, when you don't get representation, diverse representation correct on screen. What does it, it actually has a cost at the box office. And we did this again, it came out of this think tank where we did this collaboration and we, we thought, you know, what's gonna make the industry pay attention? Money, their job is money, making money. And if they think they're gonna lose money because they don't have diversity on screen and behind the camera, they might actually start to change their business practices. Some of our new stuff is our COVID tip sheets. As I said, this is all free online. Um, this is about addressing uh, COVID um, and it's, it's developmental. So we have a preschool one, we have a middle childhood one, we have a, um, a teenage one. And then these are some of our, this is a report we just released, the uh, rise and fall of fame. These are all free on our website, research reports. And we have a new one that we looked at stars um, we were commissioned for that. And as I said, we mental health is a big area and we're, we're going to release a new report, um, probably not March, maybe April. We're looking at inequality on television. Um, we're gonna throw our first summit, bringing together scholars and storytellers um, in the fall, hopefully in person. And we've partnered with the CDC and, and um, NIDA on um, public health outreach um, when we can do it. So we've had very good experiences with them. Okay, so that's the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. I'm happy to pause and ask questions or we can go on to the next piece about parenting. What do you think's better, Anne? Uh, I'm not sure, does anyone have a particular question? You can unmute and ask real quick or? I think maybe we just go on for now and we'll, we'll Okay, have a no problem. Time at the end. So this is going to be the part that's, I, I had a much longer part, but, um, and I'm happy, you know, I, I have spent a lot of years as a parent and studying this. I always say my PhD was the ultimate in project-based learning because I learned developmental psychology and how media impacts kids. And then I practiced it on my kids. Um, so I do know this very, very well. Um, so I'm going to see, you guys can put it in the chat or you can shout it out. Um, so worrying about newer media is something that's always happened. It's, you know, I'm sure your parents were worried about something. My parents were worried about something. You've worried about your own kids. You're worried about your grandchildren. It's, it's, um, it's nothing new. Par adults always worry about teenagers, um, media habits. What do you guys think? This was around the turn of the 19th century. What do you think was the media that teenagers love that adults were worried about? TV. Nope. Nope. Huh. 
You guys um, Come on, guess. Yeah. Pony Express. <laughs> no. Well, 19th century, so. Reading. Late 1800s, yeah. Maybe yeah. they read too Who much. said reading? Yeah, reading. Oh. It was reading. Novels. So five, so this is from a newspaper. Five cent novels were read by too many American boys and they were also worried about romance novels for girls. And they were really worried about boys going to the library. <laughs> um, so the reality is most of us now are like, please, please read, please read. Although they are reading on their devices. Um, but, you know, parents were judged back then. Parents have been judged for every, um, everything that kids are doing with the media, media kids are too. And the real, it's called a moral panic in the academic world. You know, there's a moral panic against this. There's a moral panic. But the reality is this is just a cycle that happens, you know, and then we have enough research to know, is this an issue or is this not an issue? And then we adjust if we need to adjust. Um, and that's sort of where we are too. We're, we're sort of cycling out of the moral panic, I think with media, COVID sort of moved it quickly. Um, but there's been a lot of research um, at this point on um, the impact of media. So the bottom line is kids aren't changing, their developmental needs aren't changing, but the platforms and the mediums do. So, you know, it was books a long time ago, it was computers, it was television, it was radio, it was comic books. Um, those things change and they might amplify certain things. And certainly with the speed of mobile technology and the infiltration, and it's so easy for any kid to use, it's, it's, it's stronger than ever before. Um, you know, not everybody can read and, and it takes a while to learn how to read. Um, but on, you know, any child, I actually don't have my video, which I would have shown, which is this, I, I kid, a little baby thinking an iPad is a magazine. Has anyone ever seen that? It's pretty funny. Um, she tries to press, oh no, she thinks a magazine is an iPad. So she's reading a magazine and she's trying to jump to another page and presses it. And then she puts it on her thigh and presses her thigh to test her finger. It's the cutest thing. <laughs> um, so wait, I skipped one. Oh, so, so developmental, needs don't change, but platforms and mediums do. So I'm going to just briefly go, I had a whole other section, but I'm going to just briefly go through some of the little bit of the research and some of sort of the issues and, and also the not issues. Um, and then I'm happy to ask questions. So when kids are young, um, there's a big movement and the American Academy of Pediatrics and a lot of um, early childhood educators have been pushing this. It actually is the three C's, but some people have added the four C communication. And it's, to, you know, adults usually think about time limits, you know, how or when they should get the phone and researchers and educators are pushing to instead think about the child, the individual child, every child's different. Think about the context you can see in the upper left-hand side, you know, that's co-viewing, that's somebody playing together versus the bottom one where the kids, you know, sitting on the beach by themselves with a pacifier and glasses reading an iPad. Those are very two very different experiences. So context is really important. Content, Daniel Tiger's um, Griffic Feelings is a great show. So paying attention to the show and the content, you know, there's, there's content that does nothing. You know, there's a lot of content that claims to teach. If you remember the baby Einstein controversy, um, and then there's high quality content um, and it's really important to distinguish. And social interaction is really important, um, especially when kids are younger, but even when they're older, it's a way we interact with media. It's a way an adult can interact with a kid. And it's a way actually you can help a child learn from media. Um, there's something new called joint media engagement, um, a new term. So it's, it's sort of like co-viewing. So co-viewing, I think is going out because if you just sit there and watch it with a kid, that doesn't necessarily do anything. But if you talk about it, that's joint media engagement. You can also do joint media engagement with gaming, you know, like play with them. So engaging with the media with the kid is actually has positive income, uh, impact. Um, active mediation is something we um, researchers push. It's like authoritative parenting. 
um, which is a parenting style that, that has lots of research saying it, it has the most positive outcomes. So active mediation is positive feedback, but still some limits. And a autonomy supported um, communication style is important. So instead of a restrictive communication style where you're just like, it's my way or the highway, to help the child independently eventually make choices for themselves. Um, introducing media literacy. So parents can do that. And I'm sure many parents do without really thinking of it that way, you know, talking to them about the content, helping them make their own choices. And teachers really should, and I think many of them are, integrating media and digital literacy and social scaffolding. So helping the child learn from it, joint media engagement, co-viewing, talking about it. Um, you know, until they're about two, they don't really understand that the media on the screen means anything, a flat screen. So helping them connect that, oh, this screen, what you're seeing on there, that color blue, here's a blue pillow. And connecting the on screen with the off screen helps them learn more. And then having um, dialogical reading techniques, which are open-ended questions, you know, what did you think? How did, and connecting it to them, their own, you know, thinking, these are the best ways to help kids get something out of the media they consume. But when adults really freak out are the tween teen years and they're challenging no matter what, um, just because as you all know, the, the child is paying much more attention to peers, is pushing away the parent. Um, but what ends up happening now is they also get phones and they also go on social media. So they're attached to their peers and are more ways to push away parents than ever before. And it's very, very challenging for a lot of adults. I had a lot of challenges as well. Um, but the, you know, people throw around this term addiction to technology and they're really, people are not addicted. There is possibly, we don't know for sure, but there are, there are possibly, you know, 5% who do get addicted um, to either gaming or, or other things. But the rest of us who say, oh, we're addicted, we're not, you know, we may use it too much. Um, and for teens, it's really a means to connect with their friends. And thank goodness they have it now because it's so developmentally important for them to connect with their friends um, at this age, they have to. And um, it's a job, it's part of the developmental task that's essential and technology helps them. So these are some of the things that are happening during early adolescence. Um, peer influence is more important. They're pushing away adults. They're still trusting. Their social cognition turns on. So they're starting to pay attention to the social world. And they're also starting to socially compare themselves. And because this is just happening and they're learning how to compare themselves, they pay attention to really obvious metrics. So what is what social status, popularity and image and money and things like that, you know, they know a lot about brands. These things are all things you can see and touch and they're paying a lot of attention to. And it's not till they get older, they can sort of understand there's other ways you can have status by doing well in school, for example. Um, and all this is happening while they're, you know, you know, they're in puberty, you know, they're socially, their groups are changing. They're many of them going from small schools to big schools. And it's, a, so it's a really challenging time for these, these tweens, teens. Um, and then you add media and this, the digital world adds pressure. So all of a sudden this peer pressure, it's everywhere. It's 24 seven, it's on Instagram, it's on Snapchat, it's on these different things. They start feeling like, oh, I have to respond right away. Or, you know, my friends won't think about me that, you know, so there's these demands for an immediate response. The social things that they always did, the mistakes we all did when we were kids, it might be permanent. People will see it. The messaging to each other is so image driven. So, you know, it's not just the messaging that, you know, the gatekeepers create, their own messaging is image driven. They can watch a lot of different friends. So they can, you know, they can do that social comparison and, you know, when they're young and they don't understand that, um, you know, a lot of what people are posting online is, is so curated, it can be challenging for some. They have a lot, a chance of much broader self-exposure. So that might be good. Like for someone like Greta Thunberg, who, you know, maybe in a non-social media world, nobody would know who she is. Um, you know, these teens are doing amazing things. You know, the kids out in Parkland, you know, because of social media, 
but if they're making mistakes, it can be very negative. And they can make more friends. You know, somebody was saying, you know, we can we can't reconnect with our kindergarten friends and our preschool friends. It's really, really challenging um, unless we remember their names. But these kids have been keeping that network from birth, basically. Um, so this is some of the research that has been positive about um, social media. And I wrote an article that's free, um, that's published in ben uh, pediatrics called The Benefits and Costs of Social Media. Um, and basically, you know, they, they found that online environments um, reinforce your offline relationships. So, you know, usually they're, they're connecting to people they already know. Um, it can lead to increased self-esteem. There's actually quite a few studies on that. It definitely increased social capital means that you connect to more and more people. It's a kind of a safer place for identity exploration. You know, it's safer to try something different online rather than in person. You, there's a lot of evidence for social support um, and more opportunity for sharing, self-disclosure, um, which has been linked to increased self-esteem and feeling closer. So all of these processes are important for teens um, for healthy growth and identity development. There are also some costs. Um, cyberbullying is a real cost. Um, I don't think it's as prevalent as people think it is, but it's probably one in five teens do get, get you know, some interaction with cyberbullying and the impact of cyberbullying versus in-person bullying, and it's usually someone you know in your environment, offline environment, is worse because it's permanent. It can, you know, the, the mental health effects are much stronger. Um, they can be exposed to developmentally inappropriate content, including porn at a very young age. Um, Depression, um, that can happen. Um, some kids do sort of, you know, can can use media. Um, it's it's highly unlikely it's the underlying cause. Um, media wasn't leading to depression, but if it, someone's depressed, they can use media to sort of tune out. And social anxiety, um, which often leads to, and this, this can happen with media, fear of missing out. Um, and for some tweens and particularly girls, they feel they need to be checking their social media all the time. And they see kids that are doing things, they weren't invited to that party, they didn't get to do that. And it's it's a, you know, it's a big betrayal. And it, you know, at that age, when it's the first time you're sort of seeing all that stuff, it's hard to process it. And some kids, it can be, um, can be devastating. But anxiety is a key component. Um, one consistent research finding, no matter what, is that there's less sleep. Um, so media does impact sleep, and especially what's in the bedroom. Um, and so trying to get everyone in the household to keep the media out of their bedroom is critical, and starting at a young age, if you can, or at least teaching the child that turning, even turning off the phone, some kids don't turn off their phone and turning off their no notifications. And the lack of sleep um, does impact mental health. So, you know, all of the research coming out of UCLA and all sorts of people is sleep is one of the biggest public health crises. Um, you know, we have now see, know that it's correlated with so many positive and negative health outcomes. Um, and if media impacts that and teens don't understand that, um, it can impact their mental health. And the last one of the biggest last points I want to get across is that there's a lot of research on video games. So people and adults often hate video games. Um, parents worry about them more than anything else. But there's so much research, in fact, probably more positive research on video games than anything else, um, in particular for girls. Um, playing action video games is um, can improve your uh, mental rotation and spatial learning skills, which underlie STEM. And for girls who traditionally test lower than um, boys on these um, spatial learning skills and mental rotation skills, um, playing video games brings their skills to the same level as boys. And you know, there's so many positive effects that the American psychologist um, did a whole article on this. And that's one of the top uh, journals in our field. 
Um, I just put this up because people do seem to like this parents. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a way to talk to tweens or teens about their media use and sort of get them to sort of notice their own thinking. So obviously, and these, I think this is based on different studies, you know, if you're spending a lot of time on Netflix, you know, there's a, there's a balance, right? So think about balance, think about themselves, think about what's right for you. And all of us can do this, right? Um, okay, so this is the last part I was going to go through if you want me to, or I can answer questions, um, which is um, maximizing the positive impact of storytelling and how you can do that and, and how kids sort of learn from stories. Um, it's sort of a research program I did when I was at Common Sense Media, which is a nonprofit, um, or I can answer questions. Well, we only have about 10 minutes left. So what do you want to do? You want to do a quick thing on the storytelling and then we'll have some questions. You said you had to leave. Yeah, unless I'm um, okay. I'll do okay. it quick. Okay. So, um, so this is just, you know, when they're two to five, um, adult co-viewing and engaging joint media, um, engagement. Um, this actually kind of targeted to storytellers a little bit, but simple stories. That's why Mr. Rogers was so great. You know, very simple, one main narrative, not a whole bunch of sub subplots. Um, and actually it's much easier for them to learn from real content and real people than animation, which is surprising since everything is animation for that age. Um, they tend to think that, um, you know, if someone looks nice, they must be nice. Um, making something very simple. There's not a bad guy and a good guy or the bad guy and good guy are the same person. You have to make it really clear. Um, when they're older, same thing. Um, they're still struggling at even up to the age of 10, even sometimes 14 to tell the moral of the story. So sometimes we assume that kids will get the moral. There's actually very re interesting research on kids not getting anything that people think they're getting at younger ages. Um, so again, simple stories. And then by 11, um, you know, they, they don't want that educational media. They don't want these, you know, a documentary that's this is what you need to do. Um, having these sort of, you know, stories where there's people with independence um, work much better. And that's the content that we work at on with at the center. And this is my book. If anyone's interested, there's it's still available on Amazon and it's actually still relevant. I teach use it in my class and uh, everything I, you know, it's the research hasn't changed too much. Um, and that's it. Well, this was wonderful. I thought I thought you gave a really comprehensive view of your center and that was, I took a lot of notes. That was very okay. interesting. So thank you very much. Now, I, I would like to open it up if anyone has questions. Um, so um, I guess just unmute yourself. There's not that many of us here. And um, so if anyone would like to ask something, does anyone have a question? Somebody, no? Well, um, you, you answered, I think, most of the questions I asked you about the other day. Although, you know, I, I, I do get very concerned about um, uh, storytelling just from media and stuff as opposed to in person sitting and reading a story with someone. And um, that concerns me mostly now because I can't sit with my grandkids and read to them. So, But you know what, there's, there's actually research showing that video chat, um, so if you were able to read to them right. over, like you could hold up the book right. um, and read to them, that is just as effective. Um, there are no differences from in-person to video chat. Um, and it's the socially contingent. So the fact that you can, she, they say something and you can speak back that helps. Um, there's also, we did studies at UCLA where we looked at learning from paper and learning from screens. And we really found no difference as, as well, even in critical thinking. The only thing that made a difference was when you added in the internet and they could sort of go off task while they were writing these papers that um, did impact their, their scores. Um, there's also a lot of research into electronic books versus print books. And by and large, um, the research is mixed. 
if if there is a um, electronic book that has hot spots and ways that you can get off topic, that might um, negatively impact learning. But if it's mainly about the story, um, there's there's some research that says it's actually engages um, kids more and they're more motivated um, and they can learn just as much. Um, they do find that parents don't tend to speak as much when they're doing an electronic book versus a print book. Um, and speaking, you know, is always helpful having that conversational interaction. Um, but, you know, honestly, there, most of the research, I just read a study where a guy did three, it was a fair, out of Oxford, three um, different groups from, you know, uh, I think it was Hong Kong, uh, England and the US, and they all took a day off Facebook to, and to see if they had more positive um, taking a digital detox, which a lot of people recommend for a full day, um, impacted their mental health. And it didn't, and in fact, in a few cases, it made it worse because they didn't feel socially connected. So, you know, the, the research, you know, and as someone who cares, I mean, face to face, and I did a study where I looked at how kids learn um, nonverbal communication with media or without media, face-to-face -face is the best place to learn, you know, these kinds of uh, cues that you don't necessarily learn from words, You and that is very important. But the good news is video is a, you know, and video chat and connecting this way is a, um, can work. It can teach us stuff. It's, you know, I think that's the lesson we've learned. And also that a lot of pe kids actually want to get off this stuff. <laughs> You know, like they want to be in person. They'd much rather be in person. Um, you know, we think, oh, that's all they want. But the reality is they want to be with their friends. And if this is the only way they can be with their friends, they'll do it. Yeah. So I'm, I, maybe I miss this. What is your website? Oh, um, it's scholarsandstorytellers.com. I'll put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. That would be great. Yeah. Okay, thank okay, you. Great, it's in the chat for those of you who can access the chat. <laughs> That's not all of us, but anyone else with a question? Mm. You know, it seems that there's a balance here. There are a lot of good things. There are a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like eating everything mm -hmm. in moderation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There that is exactly some, it. There has to be some director and the responsibility lies on the parents. Yeah. I remember getting together every Sunday watching this program after dinner. We all sat there together. We had one TV, one room. We watched it together. But I can't remember talking about it. It was yeah. just fun to watch and we left it. You know, yeah. we didn't analyze it. We were just yeah. together. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, and it, you know, I, I love this story. My, my advisor, um, her children wanted to watch Brady Bunch. <laughs> and she hated it because of the gender, the gender stereotypes. So she said, okay, you can watch it, but you have to write me a paper about the gender stereotypes after. Oh, okay. <laughs> and now her son, her daughter's like amazing and her son and her son runs Fox Searchlight and makes these incredible movies. So, you know, that critical thinking and technology, they, they need it, right? That's just their careers. Yeah. Most Here's of these the careers need technology. So right. it's really a matter of you know, that's why I say fact, not fear. Because if you say, if, if you prime fear, people feel paralyzed and don't, you know, many people, um, you know, it's flight, like it's not fight, it's flight or it's fight, take it away from you. And neither of those are healthy. It's teaching the kids um, by your own role modeling, by, by getting it into schools, digital literacy, by your own teaching at home, um, you know, by being, supporting their need for autonomy, helping them learn how to do it by themselves. Those are the ways that we're gonna teach about media. And balance is the key word. Yeah, you know, I was on a panel for the Washington Post with um, a, the guy who leads psychiatry at John Hopkins University. And someone was, you know, this a lot of worry was around mental health and screens. And someone said, oh, can, you know, do the screens lead to mental health issues and, you know, addiction? And he said, you know, if you're asking me that if a child sleeps well, gets good grades, um, is social, goes outside, and the only issue seems to be that they're on media 24 seven, 
I've never seen anyone have mental health issues that way. Like it's only because, you know, there's, if these other things are wrong, then you might look to media. <clears throat> but if they're sleeping enough, they're eating, they're doing all the things, you know, we all know makes people healthy. Um, and media is something they seem to be using too much. Um, chances are, it's just your own worry. It's, it's not an issue. So Judy, did you have a I had a question. Um, when I was a child, Dr. Spock was the Bible that all the parents went to and, and read and, and got the ideas of what was appropriate at different ages. I'm sure we were all raised by Dr. Spock. Anyway, is there something equivalent nowadays that parents are using for their, uh, that takes in all this new media? Well, my book. <laughs> but my book's only about media, so there's not like a you know, I think Sears, Dr. Sears did something when my kids are growing up. Um, yeah, you know that guy, uh, Sears, David Sears, he, uh, he's, a, he's affiliated yeah. with UCLA. He does a lot of books that are pretty good around parenting. And then there are ones for, you know, specific ages and stages. Um, you know, so there's Lisa Damore does a lot on girls. Um, and then there's Michael, I forgot his last name. He's really great. He does books on the emotional life of boys. Um, so depending on the issue or what you're thinking about, um, there are different kinds of books. Thank you. Okay, well, you, you said you needed to leave in like one minute. So yeah. uh, I, I'm going to thank you very much for this and, and remind people that you can get a recording of it. So let me know or let J Justin know and um, I think, Justin, you can probably go ahead and stop this. But those of you from our groups, if you want to stop the recording, I mean, um, if you, some of you want to stay on and chat because Yelda has to leave. Um, uh, I'll be here for another 10 minutes or so. So um, that's fine. Thank yeah. you so much. And if anyone's okay. interested in the work we do at the center, feel free to reach out anytime. As I said, I love people who want to push UCLA. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so Thank you. much. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.